I posit the view that Tantra, or something like Tantra, is the natural progression or a natural step when pursuing any life path, if we want to call it that, that is what we might colloquially call life affirming. Um, or at least a life affirming philosophy that does not require religion. Hmm. Uh, there's lots of life affirming philosophy out there and usually it goes for things like religion, Jesus loves you, life is good, we all go to heaven when we die, etc. Um, that doesn't do it for me. <laughs> uh, I'm too skeptical. Um, but I'm also too skeptical of notions that uh, life, by its very nature, sucks. Um, that's what I got from the Jains, actually. And, as I say, you can push life denial, if we want to use that term. I, I don't mind if anyone objects to my use of that term. Um, but I think people know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> I, you don't really, you can't really get much more negative than the Jains, I guess. Uh, although, Mystic of the Sands, you pointed out that the Gnostics can go pretty far in that direction, and a certain degree, uh, so do the uh, existentialists. I understand that. Um, and I can see even the attraction of it. Um, it's very, very neat and tidy and simple. Um, that's what I think the attraction of life denial is. There is absolutely nothing to be learned here. <laughs> that's, you know, oh, isn't that a relief? I thought that this life might have meant something or had some potential to mean something. Um, you reach the point of that kind of life denial, which I believe that at heart the Jains have, or at the heart of the, their philosophy, they have and everything becomes easy, in a sense. Um, there's no more incumbency upon the individual to make what he will of his or her life. Um, Tantra, on the other hand, takes an almost exact opposite view of that, where it almost doesn't even matter if life by its very nature is or is not worth living. Um, Tantra puts you in a position where, or at least it offers a position, whether or not it's achievable is a matter of opinion, it offers a position whereby life has things to offer which merit all the headaches of existence. Um, one can say that uh, the um, the amount of problems that we have in the universe are so great that they detract from any possible pluses. Um, Tantra would sort of, I would assume, would sort of um, bypass or perhaps um, not so much overcome in as much as it would transcend that kind of point of view. Um, life, if you just look at it and expect it to come to you, yes, that is perfectly uh, feasible to hold the position that life has nothing in it. Because here I am waiting. Come on, life, give me something. Um, that's uh, if you have that view that you know, okay, if life has something great to offer me, where is it? If that's your view that what life has in order to make life worth living has to come to you, then yes, I get it. I understand what life denial is. Tantra says the things in life that you want to get or that make life worth living, you have to actively pursue. You can't just say, I want this out of life, and if it doesn't come to me, therefore I can conclude that life is somehow lacking. 
We have a will. We have desires. We must actively seek that which we desire, or we must actively get into the idea that some kind of effort of the will is required to get what we want out of this life. Um, that sounds a bit contradictory considering the amount of willpower that is required to say be a particularly observant Jain, but I find the Jain version of willpower is more a version of how to avoid bad things. Let's say that you take Jainism to its ultimate extent and you want to practice salikana, you want to engage in that, you want to starve yourself to death deliberately. That requires near superhuman willpower. Why are you doing that though? To avoid another existence. You're doing something that requires almost superhuman willpower to avoid something that's even worse than the possibility of fasting oneself to death. Um, Tantra says, go get on that tiger. Go deal with the horrors of existence. Embrace them and love them. And you'll be surprised what you might find. This kind of sounds Nietzschean, but I don't, I'm not quite sure that I would agree with that. Um, Tantra actually is, if you ask me, a very personal thing. It doesn't require you to go out to act in the world, and in fact it kind of advises against it in a way, um, simply because it's so esoteric, it's so peculiar looking to anyone else, that going out and trying to be a tantric publicly, as it were, is, whew, that's dodgy. Having said that, our society has all kinds of ways in which we can act tantrically, publicly. In other words, you go to a concert and you commune with the band that's playing on the stage, and in a sense you are doing something tantric. Uh, you listen to a piece of music or whatever. Tantra, in my opinion, has it down to a science. You sit down, you meditate long enough, uh, you meditate in a both a physical and a mental sense, um, and something will happen. You will gain something in the process. Um, what you will gain, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, though, is probably not one that one could possibly describe. <laughs> um, it's like trying to describe an orgasm, or trying to describe the color red, or trying to describe what pain feels like. You can't describe things ultimately. If you look at somebody who has a particularly life-denying point of view, their language is full of intuitive um, references to how horrible life is. Uh, and yet the very same people will then say, um, you have to be cold, clinical, rational, and logical when trying to describe the good in this world. Um, well, <laughs> that's all very well, but it's a little bit inconsistent. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with inconsistency, but when you're trying to build a case for something, when you're trying to build uh, a point of view, inconsistency can be counterproductive to what you're attempting to do. I always say, look, I'm a human being. Human beings are contradictory. Okay, that's fine. It doesn't mean that I have the right to lie to myself or that I should lie to myself. There's a difference between sincerely believing two contradictory things and not sincerely believing in one of two contradictory things. <laughs> um, that which... Tantra offers you is, in my opinion, the good. The good can
cannot really be accurately described using clinical, non-intuitive language. Any more than the bad can be. You've, you know, the, the bad stuff in life is always approached intuitively. And yet we, we somehow shy away from people who will approach the good intuitively. Because, again, we have a healthy, I think, suspicion of religion. Um, whenever you start to talk in riddles, whenever you start to talk in the intuitive, whenever you start to oh, open up books with, you know, dealing with stuff like this, <laughs> uh, you see religion, you see bullshit. That's rubbish. I don't believe any of that. Okay, I understand that. But are there things in the human experience that can only be approached intuitively? I guess that's the fundamental question. Um, is there a direct, rational, logical progression that will take you from the bad to the good? completely leaving the intuitive out of it. I don't think so. I would say that um, the only way to deal with either the good or the bad is intuitively. And for better or for worse, Tantra takes you down that path. But only in the same way as those who would deny existence or the value of existence or the value of living this life also use the intuitive um, we're stuck with that part of ourselves whether we like it or not in other words we're stuck with art poetry music and all the rest of it it's part of us 